<laughs> I'm Stephen Abraham. I'm the rabbi at Bethel Synagogue. And uh, I'm Ari Azriel, and I was the rabbi at Temple Israel, and that's why I smile now because I'm emeritus. <laughs> God, that sounds like a great title. <laughs> um, this evening, we're, we're going to talk about the, the topic of, of revelation, which I, I think stopped me when I put my foot in my mouth. Here. But I, I really think at the end of the day, you know, Omaha is a little bit of, a, of, a, of an anomaly in so many ways that when folks show up at synagogue on a Saturday, well, it's a moment for the moment, let's assume folks are showing up at a synagogue Friday night, Saturday morning, wherever they're going, or a weekday minion. But when they show up at synagogue, in a lot of places, you go based on theology, right? You could go based on what is your belief in God, or, or what, what movement denomination fits kind of where you're at in, in your belief system. Omaha is the first town I've ever been in where you go based on your love or your or your or maybe you despise or you don't like the rabbi, right? Your either your family was there for a hundred years, right, and that's where you go, or you go because you've an affinity for like your friends and family that are there, or it's clergy. But theology, with the exception, I would say by the way, of probably be Beth Israel and Chabad who are not represented here, so I don't want to speak to, to folks who aren't here. But in the Orthodox world, it's a little bit different, right? Because because of of that. Um, but I would even say even in Omaha, Nebraska, the, the Orthodox world is even a bigger tent in, in Omaha than if you were to be in like Skokie, Illinois, let's say, right? It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a smaller tent than what Orthodoxy is. But at the real heart of the denominations is our understanding of, of, the, of the text and the divinity of Torah. And at the heart of that is the understanding of Revelation. Because if you, and we'll, and we're going to get into that, but that's at the heart of the con, that's really, I think, at the heart of the conversation. If you were to have the most kind of astute, which you've got the most astute reform rabbi, but if you had the most astute conservative rabbi, orthodox, I would have you, I think what you would really get would be is what is the divinity, what is the sacredness of that text as a historical document, as a document setting us forth um, going forward as Jews in our, in, our daily, in our daily life. And also revelation can be, because of the different denominations, can be explained differently. Absolutely, without, yeah. without question. If you, if just, we'll jump into this, but uh, speaking for our two movements, if you were to if you were to open up uh, a roof, which we could have also brought, but if you were to open up uh, the the beautiful but the new uh, the reform C door, right, and you opened up the um, the conservative C door, put aside at the moment like art scroll, which there which we both have things missing. Dare I say from that for sure? Um, but there are little things, right? So so not to put you in a spot, but like little things that I, that, that are interesting to to see. So. Um, for example, uh, the at Bethel, we always read the the Shema, the very first paragraph out loud. The second paragraph is silent, and then we do the third paragraph, the Bayomer and I Shali Moore. We kiss our seat, seat. Right, that that third paragraph. My understanding, <laughs> good. The, your laughing is good, so that means I'm probably right. Is in the ref, in the Reform Sidor, the second paragraph does not exist. It's better. Ah. Very cool. Yeah, everything is better. So the second paragraph, the reason it was always said quietly is because it basically talks about a God that if you do A, B, C, D, E, F, and G, these good things are going to happen. You're in. Right? You've made it. Here are the keys to heaven. Thank you, I mean, give or take. But if you don't do A, B, C, D, E, F, and G, the rain isn't going to come in the seasons, and this isn't going to happen, and da 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 but if you don't believe in that type of a God who's reactionary based on what you do about me to vote, not just about being a mensch and a good person, but based upon these 613 meets vote that we may agree or disagree on certain things about, maybe you take it out, right? Maybe, maybe, maybe in cyberland, maybe, maybe it's not there, right? And so that's a, that's a question that gets asked. So, well, the other, the other question or debate that can rage is uh, is the 
Torah a human product? Yeah, absolutely. And then you'll have a whole different group. That is a question oh, without question, without which I think as being the, the liberal Jews of our uh, liberal, not well, maybe politically too, but but at least at least being the liberal side of the Jewish world, right? That is that is where we fall out more too. Um, and, then, and then I think later in the conversation. Uh, is will raise the question is revelation an ongoing revelation i so, mean did god spoke gave us the commandments and then shut up right as or a, the, i mean is it a daily, can, is it god a daily is a Jewish experience. god how can he be quiet is it a daily <laughs> experience absolutely yeah so um mark i don't know if you can share this or or not i can tell folks where we are um uh I'll wait to see if we can pull this up. Uh, where are we at here? You got it. The far left, bottom, bottom left. See what happens. Double click. All right. Uh, make it. Yeah, do that. Centers. Yeah, there we go. And then go scroll to the bottom. I realize I'm giving lots of orders. I'm sorry. No, please do. It's just, like, going, just like the rest of my There life. you go. There you go. Okay. So there is a great, all of the Gemara is great. But there's a there's a great Gemara, a sugya, in in Shabbat 88a. Um, uh, I don't know if Mr. Rikus is is on here, but if Mr. Rikus is on here, uh, he he will he'll he'll get he'll either get a kick out of this one or get upset with me because we always go back and forth on this text, which is uh, I love him for. Um, so here's the text. Instead of talking about it, let's just look at it. It says the Gemara cites this homiletic interpretation on the topic of revelation. Revelation at, Sinai. at Sinai. The Torah says, and Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet God, and they stood at the lowermost part of the mount. So this is to say, by the way, if you were looking at this for the first time, this is the Koran edition of the English translation of the Talmud. There are two major, well, three, I guess. The original being Sansino. That's like the first, that was kind of like the first major English translation. The second, which, which is years only in front of this one was the art scroll edition, which is also brilliant. And then this is the Koran version of it. The light colored text is the filling in to make sense. The bold is the more exact translation of the Hebrew that's on the left. So what it says here is that they stood at the lowermost portion of the mount. So essentially they're at the bottom of Mount Sinai, like they're at the foot of Mount Sinai at this moment. Rabbi Avi Barhama Barhasa said the, said the Jewish people stood beneath the mountain, and the verse teaches that the Holy One, blessed be he, overturned the mountain above the Jews like a tub and said to them, so before we get there, let's just imagine what we're talking about here. Essentially, can you imagine a situation where Mount Sinai, for as, for as massive and grand as Mount Sinai could be, Mount Sinai gets picked up off the ground as only God could do. The Israelite nation is under it, is under this massive mountain. Okay, like a, as I just put here, right? Overturned the mountain the, as a, you know, as like a tub, right? If you accept the Torah, excellence. And if not, there will be your burial. Now, um, so, just imagine for a moment, right? I mean, Mr. Reich, as he's used the word before with me, and I think it's right. I don't, I don't, I'm not a lawyer, but like the word coercion. I mean, this is tough stuff. So you're telling me you, we want you to accept Torah. This is, the, this is one of these moments of revelation of at Sinai. And of course, revelation being God revealing God's self to the Israelite nation, to the Jewish people. And we'll get to a moment, actually, whether it was just the Jewish people or not, but the Jewish people for the moment. And what is the idea of, I really want you to take my Torah. I really want you to take my most sacred gift that I've got. And as much as I want you to take that gift, here's how much I'm, I love you to take it. I'm going to pick up this mountain and I'm going to hold it over top of you. And I'm going to ask you out of curiosity, what are your thoughts? <laughs> Would you like to take upon yourself the Torah? Or this could be your grave. You tell me, what are your thoughts? I like what you skipped on which is that we know that God peddled like a peddler, the Torah, and he went to all kinds of other nations. And every nation said, what's in it? And every nation found an excuse 
not to accept it. He went to uh, a nation that says, what's thou shall not steal. Excuse me, we are making our living on stealing. Uh, he went to another nation. Uh, it says, don't commit adultery. Are you out of your mind? <laughs> President Clinton. Uh, he went to all kinds of other individuals and all of them refused. So I find it interesting that also there was a little bit of this kind of conversation with the Jewish people. Without, with, I mean, it's, it's brilliant. It, yes, and almost parallel. Right, as if I'm trying to get you to do this, right? I'm, and it, it's an interesting thing because when you think about it in that regard, it's this Pandora's box type of thing. Like I've got this thing over here that is my most beloved and cherished thing being Torah, right? I want you to be my people going to these other groups of people. And their comment is kind of like, well, what's in the box, right? <laughs> what, am I, what am I signing on to, right? I happen to really like pork. I mean, what's, what's, what's in the box before I agree to it? And at some point he comes upon the Jewish people, right? Or the Israelite nation, however we want to call it, the Hebrews. And, and this, is the, this is the back and forth that we get. So, okay. So above the Jews, finding like a tub, if you accept the Torah, excellent. And if not, this will be your burial. By the way, that was not in the Charlton Heston version of the Ten Commandments. <laughs> By the way, the world, what, a lot if, of things went if, if the folks who made like the Book of Mormon made like whatever, this would be the story, by the by. So Rav Ahabar Yaakov said, from here there is a substantial caveat to the obligation to fulfill Torah. The Jewish people, and this is again, this is kind of the gremlins writing it from a bit of an Orthodox perspective, which I don't knock, but I just want to make sure that we're reading it with their with a little bit of kind of open eyes, I guess is the best way to say it. The Jewish people can claim that they were coerced into accepting the Torah, and it is therefore not binding. But just leave it there, please. Yeah. Except that we actually accepted it in a time of Mordechai and Esther, which, which is great. Uh, there, there, so wait, so, so wait, so hold on. So, when it, so then it goes back into the actual text, right? And what it says is right here, uh, right, Amar Rava Afo, right, okay. So, right, so Amar Rava Afo Bichain. So yeah, so Rava said, even so, they again accepted it willingly in the time of Ahashverosh, which is what Rabbi Azrael just said, right? In the time of Mordechai and Esther, right? The Jews ordained and took upon them and they used their seed upon them as they joined themselves unto them. And he taught, this is from, that was from Esther, the Jews ordained what they had already taken upon themselves through coercion at Sinai. So what essentially is text is that we can go back and I want to, I'd love to hear your thoughts online, in person, but, but essentially the way the text is formatting is this. So Rabbi Azrael's point, which is being offered to other nations, kind of being peddled around. I got this thing, I think you're going to want it. It's going to have a lot of good things to it, but the way we're going to build relationship, if you will, is through meets vote, right? You're going to do some things. You're going to keep kosher. You're going to do Shabbat. You do these things. This is how we're going to have relationship. Okay. Meanwhile, at some point, God must have got a little bit frustrated, I, I guess. No one, no one wants this. No one wants the thing. So you get to a point where, where in some ways, whether, I mean, I could mention as a parent, as a teacher, as an educator, you, you hold up the, the, the mountain over them and say, listen, this is what it's going to be. You're going to either accept it or this is going to be your grave. At which point they say, of course, we're going to accept it. Well, the rabbis at the time reading this story understand to themselves that saying they have a dilemma. Wait a second. If the Jews took the Torah totally out of coercion, then how do you say that they're supposed to accept it willingly so that I should get up in the morning and put on tefillin, that I should say the Shema evening and night, that I should daven three times a day, that I should care about what I put in my mouth when it comes to kashu, if all of this was taken out of, out of coercion. And so what they come back is they say, no, 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 no. It did happen under coercion at that moment. We're not arguing with you. But generations later, at the time of, of Mordechai and Esther, they actually, by taking God and by caring about God the way they did in this, in this kind of verse, it's a little bit more what have you, they're taking it, they're accepting it, right? They're taking it in. And so whatever was maybe coerced at, at day one, in year, in year 130 was no longer a coercion because they accepted it on our behalf. But it still leaves a terrible taste in your mouth. Oh, 
Yeah. So how are yeah. we how are we different from any other nation? They rejected it after finding out what's written there. We are not willing to hear it. Of course, there's the Naseb and Ishma. Yeah. There's another verse. They're trying to fix it in other ways. The, the concept, the, the concept of when we they got down the Torah, they got down when Moses got down from Sinai to Ezra, they said Naseb and Ishma, they, they will do and then we'll hear. Yeah, as, if to, is, as if to say, we're gonna we're gonna do what you're asking and then we'll understand it later. Yeah. Which is which is a, a very kind of zealous way to look at things, but not the way most people in, in you know, usually it's the other way. You look at your kids and, I mean, except when you look at your kids and say it's bedtime, right? Other than that, usually we want them to have an understanding of why they're doing what they're doing before they of do course. it. Of course. So uh, I feel good about the fact that uh, he put the mountain over their heads. I feel good that there are a lot of similarities between us and other people. There is a arrogance, I think, from telling the story of uh, uh, the Jews behaving differently. No, they also, oh my God, 613 commandments. Are you out of your mind? I don't want to do all of them. Uh, so I, I, I feel good about the Israelites having some hesitations. Uh, of course, I like also the, the Mordechai and Esther story because they fix it. It's fixed. So it took so many generations to get to Mordechai and Esther to fix their response because it, it was uncomfortable. The issue of raising the mountain over their heads. And I have been in Mount Sinai when Israel owned Sinai. It's a huge, massive mountain. Pretty scary. Uh, so it is possible that there was a need to create this coercion because maybe the commentary was written in a time where it was, there was a fear of what will happen to the Jews for being the people of God. Hmm. I'm just- No, and by the way, that it just the one thing that it struck me is, you know, there are lots of, both modern commentaries and, and older about the, the insertion of the book of Esther into the Tanakh. Totally. So it's an interesting thing that uh, Can't in, in, in this, you need Esther, right? I mean, if, if Esther is not in the Tanakh, you've got a huge, you've got a massive problem. problem. You've got a massive problem. Yeah. If the argument you're trying to make is the fact that Esther is the way that they show that we came back. Um, as a little bit of a, just a slight, as a slight tangent, but that, that Rabbi Azrael and I talked the other day about, um, there is a, there is a, an idea that I don't think either of us have ever, um, uh, experienced, at least or I've ever experienced in my rabbinate, but there is an idea that when you, when you convert a child, uh, a baby, right? So, or of a you know a Jewish family, they want to they, the child. They take you know at, you know the day, you know eight days, ten days, whatever it is, two months to the mikvah. Fine, child is raised Jewish, comes upon bar bat mitz, you know b'nei mitzvah. There is a there there is rabbinic literature that says that you're supposed to go to that child at that point and say, "Are you sure that you want to continue?" With your Jewish education being being Jewish, I have to tell you, I did it twice in my rabbinate. So okay, so 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 just then I'm then I'm going to give the the the, te, the the idea, and you give the the narrative. But but the, that is that's the idea, and and it goes back to this, because if you're the six week old baby, you you weren't given much, you weren't giving many options about going in the mitzvah. No choice, right? Your parents were your parents that that had you lovingly wanted to bring you into the Jewish people in this way. You were taken to the mikvah, so no problem. In in the world I've always lived in and still inhabit, maybe it's a little bit dare I say of a, of a looser view, but I look at it that if you're going to continue your Jewish education, meaning you stu you studied with our wonderful Hasid and you took the many hours to do that, and mom and dad are so you know behind you, and you're you're active in Kadima or USY, I look at that and I say thank you very much. Now, is it also because we're Jews and so we're fearful? That's what we're, that's what we're built on, right? We're built on fear. 
So the idea of asking the question, sometimes you ask a question, you don't really, or you shouldn't ask questions you don't want to know the answers to. I have to tell you that I prepare the parents before I ask the question. On these two specific occasions? On the two specific occasions. Because I wanted to make sure that, because they were in the room. Yeah. And I wanted to make sure they don't get a heart attack. <laughs> <laughs> and, and what if the child says, forget it. Did you know, did you feel like you knew what was going to happen? I, yeah. Okay. The, yeah. the child was extremely bright and I know that he will think about this for a while. And actually there was this almost smoke coming from the head of the child <laughs> uh, of thinking about this, but then beautiful answers. And actually I asked him to write it. And it was like, we asking from adult converts to write a journey. Yeah. I asked the child and he was capable of writing something absolutely brilliant. And those are the two times that I dare asking that question. So, so Koloko vote, because I, I don't, I've, I have never, I've, I've never asked the question. I, not, I don't think, but I knew, right. I knew what the child yes, was no saying, so than, that's why I felt. Yes, that was it. That, I wanted to try this. Actually. That's true. That's true rabbinic leadership, by the way, when you know, because if you don't know, you don't ask the question, but, but that's, but that's, but that's the dilemma, right? Because it's no different, right? We give, we go back to the, we go back to this person. Right, and we don't do that if you're an adult, right? If you're an adult and you're making this decision, you're making this decision, that's okay. But as a child, we, we, we almost like wanna make sure, are you sure you wanna be throwing your lot in with this group of people that's been persecuted for 5,000? I mean, like, are, you're, like, are you sure you're in? Um, and which, which sometimes it's an interesting question to ask long standing Jews. Well, so this is the other thing. It's one of the most common terms that I, I don't, I don't push back from this. I don't do any, you know, but but um, in the work that I've been able to do since I got out of rabbinical school and kind of it's opened my mind to-, to, to You never to, get to, out of rabbinical school, come on. Oh, thank God, I'm out of rabbinical school. I'm in a different type of school now. <laughs> You're still but I'm studying. Out of, I'm still studying because yeah. I'm out of rabbinical school. Um, but that being said, the, the, there is something to be said, um, Yeah, we'll come back to it. There, there's, there's. Yeah, but, but shouldn't you? I mean, bar mitzvah at age eighty three, that we sometimes officiate him because people got to eighty three. Yeah, I mean, but but I think adult bar mitzvah, so, for example, that's why adult bar mitzvah is so important, especially to generations of women that were never invited to have a bat mitzvah. Absolutely. So, I guess my I guess my syntax my my. my um, the, the word that is coming to me, you know, that's kind of like what's become the, like the, the nomenclature, the vernacular would be, we're all Jews by choice. We have to be. Right. And, and so clearly I think, and I don't, this isn't a knock, I, I don't, I, you know, there are plenty of people who would disagree with that statement. Right. But, but I, I think that's where this comes into play. And so we're going to flip over and look at a different text. But if for me, this text from, from what Rabbi Azrael has brought up, but is brilliant for me, is that what if we take this text and we say to ourselves, okay, we're all Jews by choice. So we're all, we're all the baby. So if we're all the baby, right? And at some point we were all coerced, right? Whether we were born Jewish or not, right? I was dropped off at Hebrew school three days a week. I wasn't get, nobody asked me if I wanted to go, right? Trust me, my penance is going to be going to work was becoming a rabbi. So I, the minute I choose to say, I want to live this life and I want to care about this document, I'm making a choice. No different than the 13 year old or the 12 year old in your office made that choice. That well, I, I don't, I, I can tell you for sure that I made a choice to be a Jew. Yeah. And that's what I'm hearing. Almost all the more, yes. Oh. I mean, uh, my, my parents uh, went to Israel not because they were diehard Jews. They were running away from the communists. And so I came to a summer camp in Wisconsin. <laughs> and for the first time in my life, I had Shabbat. It, it, it's, it's, yeah. And look where I am. Listen, oh my God, I, I, I have a, 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 a friend once made the comment that, well, day school is wonderful, 
but but, but but in some ways day school made her made her less in, less impressed with Judaism. It was camp that made her you know there was camp that saved her Thank from, God from, from 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 that. So all the more so. Maybe, um, maybe you want yeah. to stop and ask if we have some. Feedback. Yeah, I don't know if people are. I haven't, I haven't seen any hands up or anything yet, but if you do, yes. go ahead. She she can request the live. Um. My name was mentioned at the beginning, so I thought I had to respond. <laughs> <laughs> only, but only in a good way. Right. Uh, anyway, anyway, Steve, please. Yeah, yeah. First of all, the, the legal word is duress. Any contract entered under duress, that's a threat, you know, is not a valid contract. And we, I start from there. You have to ask yourself, uh, why is the very first part of the uh, commandments saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the house of slavery? Why, why say that? What, what's the point of that? And the point is that only a free people, not a slave, can make a contract. And th that's how I interpret uh, that's what, what, what's going on here. You don't need a, you don't need an upside down mountain. As a matter of fact, the upside down mountain invalidates the right. contract. The so, better okay. question is, and maybe Rabbi Abraham, you were on the right track, uh, on a different track here. That is, what did you, what did they accept? when they made the, their acceptance. They couldn't possibly have accepted thousands of years of commentaries and books and discussions and everything out. What does this Torah mean? Okay. Well, there, that is, that is something. In other words, we're, we're not accepting every detail of, you know, because that would be impossible. What we're accepting is the idea of this, the, the, this is a holy document coming yes. from God. And we, over time, we will uh, uh, begin to understand what that means. Never perfect, never ending, never perfection. No one can say, I completely understand everything. That isn't how it works. But that's a better way of looking at things, it seems to me. Then talking about an upside down mountain, you know, where people are, are threatened. I don't know what that accomplishes at all. Well, without question, but let's, so let's look at this, the second, I, I think the second text actually brings a little bit of light to that as well, but I don't, I don't disagree. Steve, I don't, I mean, very clearly, I don't, I'm not a fan. I, I mean, I, I love the text because I like the text because I think it provokes thought. Um, that's not the text that I that I use when I when I'm thinking about my belief system. Uh, it's not necessarily where I'm at. Um, but that that being said, it is. Uh, I think it's a it's a thought provoking text for for why we do what we do or why we don't why you know why we don't do what we what we what we could do or should do or or some people other people do. Um, if we flip, there we go. Okay, let's let's look at this one. So. So Bamibar Rabba is a Midrashic commentary um, on the book of Numbers, um, on, on the book of Bamibar, on the book of Numbers. So this is one of the, this text for me is, one, is, a, is, a fave, is a fave, right? This for me is one of my favorite texts because this to me talks about the universality of Torah, which is to say, that when I go hang out with my non-Jewish friends and they talk about Bible, fine. I know for me, Tanakh, they're talking about Bible. They got a couple extra books that they added in there at the end. That's fine, no problem. That being said, it's just as much theirs as it is mine, in, in, in my opinion. And that's because of, of, of this text. So <clears throat> what we get is, and God spoke to Moses in the Sinai wilderness, right? This is literally, this is verse, this is verse one of Numbers, okay? Why in the Sinai wilderness? It's an interesting question, right? Like, 
Why I mean, not in Egypt? Well, well, why not in Egypt? Or better yet, I mean, not to be better yet, but but why not in, in Canaan or why not in Israel? Like, I mean, if you're going to give us this thing that's so important that you want us to hold for all time, it's your greatest gift. Forget, let's put us at the mountain story for a moment because everything's all like tangential to, to this is not, nothing's kind of concrete to each other. Why not give it in a place? Why not, by the way, you've got miraculous stories about why the Kotel, well, why the, the temple was where the temple stood to where Al-Aqsa is, to where the Dome of the Rock is, right? These are all holy spaces mm. because of the fact of the stories that were there. It's no re it's the same different that churches, be synagogues become churches and, and like holy spaces are holy spaces, whether they be Omaha, Nebraska or in Jerusalem. And now we can have it on the phone, the whole Bible on the that, phone. It, so it's there. Why didn't he give us on the phone? Well, that would have been a whole different conversation. Yeah, we'll but, but nevertheless, <laughs> right? So we could have had it. So fine. So why, why was it in the Sinai wilderness? From here, the sages taught the Torah was given through three things. Fire, right? Aish was given by water, fine, the Mayim, Ubamibar, and the wilderness. How do we know that Torah was given through fire? They give the verse. Right now, Mount Sinai was all in smoke. They, they cite the verse from smoke. Okay. How do we know the Torah was given through water? As it's written, both the heavens and the clouds dripped water. Interesting that they go, by the way, just as a, as a sure. kind of, right, as a peripheral, they, they go to judges. It just is an interesting kind of what have you, fine. And how do we know the Torah was given, in the, was given through wilderness? From the words, and God spoke to Moses in the Sinai wilderness. Okay, so we know that, that for some reason they wanna throw these things out there. They want these three things apparently to be out there, right? They say fire, water, wilderness okay fine but the question still comes back to the very beginning and why was the torah given through these three things because just as these three because just as these three are free to all the inhabitants of the world so too are the words of torah free to them as it is written Oh, all who are thirsty, go to water, even if you have no money, if you have no means, from Isaiah, like all who are thirsty, what have you, almost like the same kind of ideas we hear on like the, the, the Haggadah idea, same concept. Another interpretation, and God spoke to Moses in the Sinai wilderness from Bamibar means if one doesn't make oneself ownerless like the wilderness, one cannot acquire wisdom and Torah. And therefore it says the Sinai wilderness. And I find this verse very helpful to speak about revelation, ongoing revelation. So in because we we if people make themselves as a desert ah and they're open, why would it be one time, one shot? Is it possible that if we are willing to appear in front of God with no possessions, Fkill, then maybe we can still receive the gifts of revelation. And revelation is an ongoing story. I, I in my theology, in the way I look at, at the conversation that people can have with God, it's an ongoing revelation. And so, this opens the door to look again and again and again at the Torah and the commandments and to work out issues to try to bring it to modernity without, of course, skipping the essence of what this is all about. I love I loved going to a kibbutz in Israel and seeing how beautiful, in order to not be cruel to the cows, they created those automatic machines that milk the cows on Shabbat. Wow. Right. I'm Amazing. sure Moses did not think about it. <laughs> okay, so, all right, I got two. All right, so, first of all, so one thing going back to the text. So, one of the, one of the comments that, that isn't in here, but it is, well, it's in here, but it's just not said, okay, is the other reason you give it in the wilderness is where did, who does the wilderness belong to? It doesn't belong to anybody. It's the wilderness. 
right? This was no, this was no man's land. This wasn't, the, so, I mean, we, we can look at it today and say, oh, it was Sinai, it was this, it was the peninsula. But, but th th there, were pro there were no leases, right? There was no property lines. The UN, thank God, for better or worse, still exists, doesn't it, what have you. The, U the UN didn't exist to put down lines of where things were. So to give it in the wilderness is to give it to all of humanity. It's, it's not to give it to, to offer it. right, right. It's, it's it, even better, right? And by the way, I mean, although interestingly enough, we don't know where the other offers took place. I mean, I'm, I'm with you, but I, but how it, but nevertheless, when it finally got given, at least according to this text, this text is asserting that it got given essentially in no man's land. It got given in a place where it couldn't, you couldn't just simply say, ah, it was given to the Jews. Well, new. Explain to me how you know it was given to the Jews. Well, it wasn't given in Jerusalem. It wasn't given in Canaan to the Israel. It's, or in Auschwitz. Right, it, right. It was given, it was given here. So I think there's something like very important for us to keep in mind, um, both, I would say, in, in, a, in a really broader scope. So 50,000 feet when we're talking to our non-Jewish brothers and sisters. But then I would also say when, when we can get into it, it wasn't given to either of us directly in that, in that it, was given, it was given right here in the middle of the table as well, right? And, and that's, that's also really important. It's also really hard, right? To be able to do that and to accept that. Um, I wonder what, that it wasn't there. But to your, but to your point, one quick thing. Yeah. The, I had a, um, I grew up in Columbia, Maryland. I grew up in a suburb of Washington, DC. The, the rabbi in Columbia, Maryland, um, it, it, I didn't know this when I taught there. Uh, she was a wonderful, wonderful woman. She still is a wonderful, wonderful woman and teacher and rabbi. She also brilliant. Um, Susan Grossman is on the law committee. She is just a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant thinker. Rabbi Grossman once made the comment to me that the way she understood the theology or revelation of giving of Torah when he mentioned the phone was that she imagined, and, and I think in this room we can appreciate this analogy, I hope, is that she imagined that Moses was given the Torah on a floppy disk with word 1.0. That was her understanding of Torah, was that Torah was handed to Moses on a floppy disk with Word 1.0. But you and I both know the way that Word works today is if you take that floppy disk, which now doesn't exist, by the by, but you put the floppy disk in your brand new Mac computer using a USB thumb drive, if you can still find one of those, and you plug it in, the Word application is going to open up and say, do you want to update the parameters? Because it's going to say, we, we don't read this anymore. It, it, like this is gobbledygook, right? Like it's, if it was in wingdings, like font, right? We need to update this to the, to the modern version of Word. And you have an option. The two of us, maybe a little bit less. I maybe want to go to Word 97 and he wants to go to Word 2021. But, but, <laughs> but we're saying, yeah, I want to update it. And, and then there are others who are saying, uh-uh. Right, give me windings, right? Because that's where they're at, they, and that's okay. But but that was the way that she was able for me as a high school and college student looking, starting to look at rabbinical school, wanted to understand my own theology. Mm. That was the way she ran it, which which for me, I don't know if it works for like if it if, if but but that's what worked for me at the time, and I still use that with our high school students because they don't know what I mean, they don't know what a floppy disk is, but they know what word is. So it works out all the, it works out all the same. I want, I want to uh, highlight one sentence in the second text, and it comes very close to the end. If one does not make oneself ownerless, like a desert, like a midbar, one cannot acquire wisdom of the and Torah. I find this a powerful sentence that one needs to be able to reduce their egos and be able to accept wisdom without pushing it and saying, I already know that. There's so much that we don't know. How many more years will take us to cover all the text that we have? Huh. At, at, I mean, <laughs> no, we'll I, never get that. I'm, I'm looking at uh, this Sefria. Oh, you mean? Yeah. No, I'm, I'm saying we need to constantly empty ourselves 
from whatever oh. we know and be like a desert to be able to accept new things, new wisdoms, even if it comes from different teachers and they don't have to be all Jewish. I have- Absolutely. I, I, I have definitely experienced uh, as a result of some of the work of the tribe faith of sitting with some clergy who are, who have insight into our Torah and they're not Jewish and they're not rabbis and they don't teach in seminaries. What I'm, what I'm saying is that even anytime you have someone who has wisdom, you need to make yourself as a desert to be able to absorb, accept, and listen. I didn't like so you 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 were sighing a lot tonight. <laughs> what is going on? No, I think that what's so interesting is that uh, if you think about Abraham and Sarah, before they were Abraham and Sarah, right? And they were Avram and Sarai. Yeah. They had to become, I don't mean this is the, like, like, that they didn't become ownerless, but, but they, they almost gave up self, right? They, they went, they, they did left, right? And, and they, they left, left home. They left they, home. They left home. Yeah. They left everything that they knew. They left that here to go on the journey. Yeah. So in some ways, it's almost as if unless um, um, uh, I'm forgetting the name of the podcast, although I'm going to I'm going to find it. Um, there is a, a podcast that, that is that is out there. Um, anyway, I'll find it. The brain is the title of it. They, and then one of the recent things was when you're talking to somebody and they're making an argument about a point that they believe in. OK, and that they're strongly believe in this point. The best thing that you hidden brain is the podcast. The first thing to do before you turn to them to say, I, I don't agree with you or have you thought about the first thing to turn right psychologically is to say, are you open for feedback on what you just said? <laughs> because. By the way, nine times out of 10, of course, it's going to say yes. But, but they need to like cognitively get to the place where it's like, oh, that's what you're about to do. Because if you immediately come to them with the other thing, it's gonna almost be like a, a, an attack. I, I think this is exactly right. I think that there is something to be said. We use about, about non-Jewish clergy, about, about our, our non-clergy, just, just non-Jews in general, looking at this text. I, I've never realized the best, one of the most best experiences I've ever had was I was sitting at Starbucks. I was sitting there with a, a dear friend who's the pastor at St. Luke Methodist uh, Church here in Omaha, Crossenburg High School. And we're talking about the Abraham and, I mean, I'm going back to Abraham and Sarah, but we're talking about the Abraham story of Genesis. And I said to him, well, you've heard the story, of course, about Abraham breaking the idols, like that story, like that's what have you. And he looks at me and he's like, I, what are you talking about? And I said, well, there's this, you know, I want to say apocryphal. There's a midrashic story that talks about the fact that Abraham goes into his father's idol shop, into Terah's idol shop, and he breaks all the idols. And he looks at me, he's like, is that in the text? And I'm like, no, no, you can't read the text without reading the midrash. And he's like, the what? <laughs> and, at that re and at that moment, at that moment, I realized, wait, there's something beautiful here, which is that he doesn't have the midrash. So therefore, for me, it's as if he's getting like, a third of the story, right? I'm sitting here saying you're missing out on eight, which by the way, I do believe, right? You're missing out. At the same time, they've also written in for themselves stories. We automatically, it's a little bit tangential to Revelation, but, but it's in Revelation to, open up, to opening ourselves up to listening, right? We automatically as Jews, because of our commentaries, we automatically look at, at, uh, at Ishmael, and at Asav, as these as as these bad characters or these bad actors, but if you if you because if you look at the commentaries, if you simply read Torah for the, on face value and read the shot of Torah, just the plain text reading, there, there there's real. I mean, there's nothing there. Although the the dots over the name. Uh, <laughs> it's because they thought it could have been a mistake, and Ezra was double checking. They didn't have whiteout. 
Yeah. Also, I, mean, yeah. Yeah, I mean, no, no. What I'm saying is absolutely. Uh, I, I think the 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 way we look very interesting commentary from Spanish commentators talking about Sarah. You cannot believe in what colors they drew Sarah as this vicious matriarch that had to keep because they did it because they lived in Spain. You better be good to the stories that are coming, not as a result of bad Sarah. Right. Yeah. So, uh, so each generation adds so this is their ability of revelation. So that's but so that's it. So with the with the time we remain, I think that's the that's the conversation. Is I don't believe. And I'm, gonna, I'm speaking for myself, I mean, as a, as a conservative rabbi, but I think that if I, I, and I don't ever speak for a movement, but for, for conservative Judaism, revelation was not a one-time experience. So it's true about reform right. Judaism. Right. It, it just, it wasn't. That was, that was maybe like a really amazing experience, by the way, that probably would have been fairly amazing to have been there. Although, according to some people, we all were there. But nevertheless, that in itself is amazing. But revelation can occur in, in other instances, whether it be it, it be beauty, it be sitting there and you see the rainbow and you and you see the blessing over it. Or you read Eli Wiesel. It's what right. is Eli Wiesel life all about? It's, it's a, right. One can see, long revelation. You can see it in multiple in multiple places. It didn't just happen. And I I think I, and I wonder from from your experience in the rabbinic, and I only I mean, just you know a snippet is I, I think that for, for many of my folks, they're got, whether it's God or it's you know kind of the, the 12 steps, there's a greater being in the universe, whatever you wanna name the thing, the, the thing they want to experience, it's like a golf shot. And when they have that experience, they want, to, they want it again. Right. And that's the revelation. The revelation could be hearing, I mean, you know, could be, listen, some people this week may have never seen Hamilton before. So they went and saw Hamilton and they closed their eyes and they listened to the music and they opened their eyes and saw the amazing dancing. And they felt this leap in their heart of like, as if like the world was actually a perfect place. Right. Which unfortunately then you leave the theater. But, but that being said, like, there are those moments. It could be. It, it could be that it could be reading about about an an individual. It, I, there are all of those moments where I think God is revealed. I mean, I think that what's the great line? God is where God is wherever we look. Right. The only thing you can't find God is you decide that you just want to stop. You just want to stop looking. And I think that's that's the thing for us today. I think for at least I, for at least for me, I, I you know that when you stop looking, then the then the game is over. Then you're gone. Then you're done. But if you're willing to keep looking, then that's the thing. And I'll even go so far as to say, and I mean, I, I am, I'm, I think there's lots of places to look, right? We may be doing a renovation of a building. I, I, I feel strongly about creating sacred space that's meaningful that's so that you can find that. But I would be lying to you to say, that that's the only place you can find it. So God is. Right? Just because my sanctuary has an eternal light, does that not mean that that's where God has to be present? And I think that that's the thing we have to keep in mind. And I think, I think that's what calls us to pay attention to every human being. Because what about mm. the lights inside of every human being? I mean, we mentioned, we always light candles when death comes. It's true. What about those candles? What about the candles that we buried? The candles that are moving around us. They're part of our lives. How much light did we receive from those individuals? And maybe this is in a way a miniature revelation that takes place every time there is a serious encounter with another human being. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I have been open for those moments and I think uh, they happen all the time. We just don't pay attention. We are meeting well, some incredible 
people, incredible moments, and we need to be open. We need to be there for those encounters. And sometimes we miss it, and we know we miss something, and we regret it. And that's that's why we should. That's the idea of the schach on the sukkah. The, the the, you have to keep it open. That's why we don't put a, a ceiling on the sukkah because we need to allow for the rain to come down, but also for the sun to warm up. I will never forget that uh, uh, custodian at uh, one time, the Temple Israel, he heard in the news that there will be rain. And so he put a tarp on the top of the sukkah to protect the sukkah, only to run immediately when the rain started and with a knife cut the tarp so the water can be absorbed. Wow. I mean, this is what we need to be. We cannot cover ourselves with artificial tarp because we then don't allow for the rain and the sun to penetrate into our souls. That's why I love this. We have, you whoever know. doesn't do, he doesn't make himself as a desert, you what a mistake. Us. Yeah, I, I think that that's that's the 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 crux of it. The interesting, the the other thing, just to kind of throw out there though, is you know we're we're again, as I said, we're kind of representing the the liberal wings of of, of Judaism when it comes to the concept of of revelation. And we don't apologize for that. No, in no way, shape, or form. But just we also want to be clear, um, respectful. Yeah, yeah, and so that revelation you know there there's and that's important to realize that um you can certainly believe that god only revealed god's self once and you're you're and yet you're searching for that to happen again you don't believe it has you're but you're you're searching and you're still well, observing i, I don't believe it happens yeah well i well, I, I, I agree but i think for there are others who say it happened once yeah. and are searching for that second they're searching for that second time um uh there there i was i was not there i don't think i, I don't think my parents were even alive there was a there's an apocryphal story that, that abraham joshua heschel um who may you know who was of course a giant and is quoted for so many things but but that heschel was speaking to the ra convention um and heschel's had lots of kind of amazing kind of one-liners but he looked out at the convention body, uh, which at the time, of course, was essentially a bunch of old white men. Um, uh, thank God we've added so much to that since that. Um, and he looked at them and said, "Did you see the miracle? Did you see? Did you see the miracle this morning?" And of course, you know, you a bunch of you know, dare I say, you know, egotistical like rabbis, right? They're all sitting there, you know, right? The conservative rabbinate. We're a, we're a real humble bunch, and they're all looking at each other. Being like, what are you, all right, like, all right, cra like the crazy man's up there talking, like, what's, you know, what's going on? And, and Heschel was, I mean, he, he was a little bit out there. Um, and he turned to them and said, the sun came up, right? He paused for a minute because for him, like he, he woke up in the morning and he would say Hashkivenu at night because he authentically believed that the Hashkivenu prayer that your body, that the rabbis didn't know this, they didn't what have you, that we sing Hashkivenu and the Hazan and Bethel sings it be beautifully, right? This beautiful tune, as I have no doubt that it's done in Temple Israel as well, and that our souls would literally leave our bodies and that we're praying that it's going to come back the next morning. We and hope. and he, we hope. We pray, we hope. But this is Hashkivenu that we put to this beautiful Craig Taubman tune. It's like, if you really read it in the actual Hebrew translation, you may not be singing it to this tune, but nevertheless, he woke up that morning and he, he sat there in front of the entire body of the rabbinical assembly. He said, did you see the miracle? Because they were all past it, right? They, they, they were, well, there was no iPhone, but they're sitting there and they're worried about whatever in the God's name they're worried about that morning. The fact that the sun came up, like they didn't realize like that was like, they, did God reveal God's, like God was right there. You just chose in that moment not to open, not to open your eyes. I got one more that I, I probably, please. No, but you did something very important that I need to teach. Please. So when, when we mention a person like Heschel, the tradition says that the lips in the grave are moving. Ah. So he did something wonderful. Okay. By you giving do, this respect so, to the rabbi. So that, 
so so you've got that through the other one and I'll and I'll and and you know so there, no one is going any place. We can continue for hours. They're going. They're, the, two, the, the two redheads may go to sleep. So, so you can stay all you want. No, 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 but so the other one, though, that I think when it comes to revelation, that I do think is important. And again, I think I, I, I hope we've tried to share these two texts. I think I think you can get Rabbi Azrael where we are on on revelation being something that is an ongoing tradition or something an ongoing condition something that takes place that you got that you've got to work for it. You've got to look for it. Um, you know, I mean, I really think work for it's a great idea, but I, I want to just push one other, you know, kind of great, I think, story that works for me. So um, Rabbi Azrael spoke about welcoming and learning from others. One of the stories that I use this at Bethel all the time, and I, I don't teach this, it's just, a, it, it's in the back of my mind. So listen, we have a dynamic and a dynamic both being wonderful and eccentric Jewish community. And, and we don't even know everybody in our Jewish community. I mean, that's what we think that we do. There are people that show up out of the blue and, and we should welcome them in my personal opinion with open arms. But there is a, there is a, the story is that Elijah the prophet will one day show up and is gonna show up at your synagogue or your home and is gonna show up in rags. That's how he's going to reveal himself. And the question will be, if we sit there and we welcome in Elijah at that moment, that's how, again, depending upon your belief of messianism, but, but that would welcome in the, the time of, of, of the Messiah, this would happen. But the problem is, is that, part, pardon me for what have you, but, but Elijah's not going to show up in a Land Rover in a three-piece suit and walk in this building. So we've got to be prepared that the revelation of, of that godly figure is going to show up in our doors and we've got to be looking. So just as Heschel looked for the sunshine, right, and saw the sun come up, we also, as, the, as, as Rabbi Azrael said beautifully said, there are lights in every human being. We have to know that story, of course, it's not, it, it's touchy, it's feely, it's great. But the whole point was the idea that I've, I've looked at, not really congregants, but I've looked at situations at that bell and I've mentally just noted to myself, right? That person to me is Elijah because I don't understand. I have so many questions. I, I don't even know what to do, but yet, you know, something that at that moment is how God is revealing God's self to me. And my response is it, it, it's not about all of these questions I can ask. And it's not even about me understanding. It's just about the fact of saying, this at that moment, how God's being revealed and my responsibility is that, you know, something, well, how can we help? What can we do? What do you need? Because I would rather be on that side of the equation than on the equation of saying, you know, something, we turn them away. And when the book is written, the final book is written, that Elijah showed up at, you know, Omaha, Nebraska. And we said, I'm sorry, but, but we're full or you're not dressed appropriately. So we could go on for, uh, thank you. We could go on for a long, long time. Um, I, I, I realize there's some stuff in the chat. I don't, I realize you kind of hit, you know, what have you. A lot of the questions there. The but, I don't see any questions, but the, but Karen did put the link into the hidden brain. Ah, great. So really, really great podcast. No, not inherently Jewish. Um, I love it. But it's a great, but it's a great podcast. So if you if you're looking for something to do, not that so any of us. Is it again one more time? Shanka, what's his name? Uh, yeah, Hidden Brain. I'll send you the Hidden link. Brain. I'll send you a link. It's great. Looks like there's 14 comments. Well, there's there's comments. There's, there's no, but there's no. But it's not I mean, there's no questions in there. Oh, All right, Mark. As always, thank, thank you, you, Rabbi. Thank you, very much. thank you, everybody online. Thank you for joining us. If you were here in person, it's it's much appreciated because it's really hard to teach to us. Thank you. Thank you to both of you. <laughs> hey, have a Thank wonderful you, night. Everybody. We love you. Amy, take it easy, everybody. We love you, Shane, David. We can see you. The room was not empty. It's wonderful yes. to see you. Hi, Rabbi. Stay, stay warm. Stay warm. Stay dry. Stay safe. Right. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.